everyone. Thanks for joining tonight. We have a couple of people, Zach and Holly, who weren't feeling well, so they are not going to be on. And um, they'll be able to watch the recording. I want to welcome Diane Green. Diane is our guest speaker tonight, and she'll be talking um, about, I don't know, 5 or 5.15, and hopefully jumping in as I talk tonight about finding and assessing land. So uh, we're happy to have you with us, Diane. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And OK, so we are in week four already. Um, in some ways, the weeks go slow, but in other ways, they go fast. So tonight's topic is finding and assessing farmland. I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about last week's homework. And I thought I would just show one of the questions and say, let's talk about your land requirements worksheet and what are your long-term business and land tenure goals? And then I'm wondering if uh, you're starting to think about a strategy to get there. So David, I'm gonna start with you. Um. Yeah, and I thought the worksheets were very helpful just with the list and this this one, um, it, 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 I, I think I'm thinking more of it as a phase in. So uh, my wife has a job that provides health insurance, which is huge for us. And so I clicked uh, generate sec secondary or supplemental income. And I think it's, you know, going to be something that hopefully can be phased in long term for primary source. But um who knows what's going to happen between now and <laughs> 10, 20 years, so. Right, absolutely. Uh, Greg. Yeah, for us, it's going to be a secondary. And I think one of the eye openers for me last week was, was truly how small the, the markets are in Northern Idaho. And we were traveling home and I just said, you know what, we are not going to with the, the small operation we're looking at and the market size, this cannot be, it, it can be our dream. It's not gonna be full time. So there are some things that um, I'm already working, I'm already working, I've already put into motion in terms of what I believe can be almost a primary income for me. And then this, the farming thing for me, it, it is a, it's a real passion right? It, this is what I want to spend most of my day doing. So um, it's going to be options trading and stock trading. That's going to be my first source of income. And I can get that up and done early in the day and then have my most of my day to, to work on the farm. Okay. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Janelle. I always get turned around because I use Google uh, Google for my meetings for work. And so whenever I switch to Zoom, I'm always confused when I have to unmute the first time. Um, I'm going to echo what David said, that it's probably a little bit of a phase in with um, initially generating secondary or supplemental income. Um, however, considering I'm... I, I am technically using my my farming business as a consulting business for the cooperative uh, that I'm a part of as well. So I'm already kind of generating income mm -hmm. with that cooperative farming experience as part of my um, primary income. So, but it's still technically off farm. I have to, you know, I can't be out in the field. I have to take time away from being in the field to like attend to writing bylaws you know those right. are two totally different things so um yeah i mean just i would i would say i would echo what david was saying about it being uh secondary at the outset and then working towards primary okay great thanks uh tyler and leah we can't hear you for some reason
now? Yes. Okay. Cool. Had to go through a couple options. But when we first got started, don't touch it. It'll mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> We're there. Okay. So when we first got started, it was kind of secondary. We didn't really pull anything from it from the first few years. And I was working at Northwest Farm Credit. But now it's primary for us. And that's long term is that it continues to be. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Melinda. Okay, so originally I thought that this would be pretty easy to make it primary. Um, now with talking with people and taking this class, it'll definitely be secondary. I'm planning for at least two years. So yeah, gonna go with that and hope for the best for two years. Sure, absolutely. I get that. So one, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this checklist is this idea of building equity and wealth over time. And one of the reasons that farmland is so expensive, and I know I talked about this already, is that farmers often have their equity and their wealth in their land. And so when they're going for that land transition and transitioning out of agriculture, they need to really maximize the the return on that investment because they're relying on it for all of their retirement income and that's a really uncertain future especially now that health care is really expensive if you are going to go into assisted living at some time there's like so many different things that are at play and so one of the things that I would encourage you to start thinking about now is your exit strategy and what is it that you want in the end? And if you are gonna ultimately buy land and leave that land, what, what do you want to happen with that land? Because how you build your equity and how you build your wealth and, and how you look at your retirement is gonna make a lot of difference on what happens with that land once you are not the steward of it. So I just wanna put that out there now because we are seeing that because many people have relied on their land for their retirement and they don't have other savings or other income generating streams, we're in, in really a land crisis. That's one of the reasons that we're there. So tonight we're gonna talk about how to choose your target location. I think many of you have already got a good idea, but dialing in a little bit deeper on that. And then I'm gonna talk some more about finding out about land prices and rental rates and some of those things that we identified as the carrying costs. It's specifically in terms of um, land assessments and what the taxes look like on land. And then we're gonna be talking about land assessment and Diane is gonna help us with that. I'm gonna show you a couple of online tools and other resources that are available. So again, this is kind of the 1000 foot view of all of these different things. So I know many of you have selected a target location for your land search and are really tying that to your personal and business goals and really dialing in what you're looking for and what you need. So this piece about finding out about real estate and rental values is kind of tricky and we're gonna be talking about that. And then in addition to that, you really need to look at the suitability of the land for what you wanna do. And are there any covenants or encumbrances on that land that might be a little bit hidden that you need to uncover? And then developing your plan. So choosing a target location, you know, it is really important to find out about the agricultural and business conditions. And I would say that one of the things that um, Luke and Emily didn't look into really deeply, I think, was this kind of conditions of Kootenai County for agriculture. Like we do have agriculture in Kootenai County, but however, you know, it's not um, in terms of policies, land use policies and economic development plans, a place where agriculture was seen as part of the future. And that's where they talked a little bit about having to go through so many um, permissions to be able to do what they wanted to do with their land. That's part of the reason that they ran into those challenges because land was zoned and the the different uses that people had in their mind about land was not really around agriculture. So it's really important to understand those things. And then thinking about your personal goals as well as your business goals. And we talked about, about this a little bit, but these personal goals can actually change as you get older. The importance of being near your family and friends might change at different stages in your life. Um, 
what you want in terms of access to health care. What amenities do you really want in a city or a town and how, how far are you willing to travel? How remote can you be? Because what we're really seeing now is that the land that's most affordable is pretty remote. And is, is that gonna be okay if you're purchasing land? And like I said, do you wanna be close to health services? Do you wanna be close to a university or other type of organizations that provide things like music? And, and if you're into theater or different aspects of culture, those might be important to you and you wanna consider how far you're going to have to travel to that. And then what is it that you would like available to your, their, your children as they grow older? What kind of culture would you like them to grow up in? So researching different parts of agricultural conditions is really important. And so we're gonna talk about some tools to look at climate and growing season. We talked a little bit before, I think about water availability and rights. We also have some great webinars on the Cultivating Success site that's specifically looking at water that I encourage you to watch. Looking at the types of agriculture in the area. And I think this is really important because this is your cohort. Do you, do you have a community of farmers in your region that you can network with, that you can learn from, ment have mentorships with, and do you have the markets uh, that you're co-creating how you want to sell your product? I think that that is really important. And then is the type of agriculture that you want to do in terms of your production practices, what you're choosing in terms of your actual management practices, something that um, your community is friendly to because communities do have um, historical ways that land is used. And if you're gonna be using it in a way that's different than that, you might run into some, you know, some challenges or education that you're gonna be doing of your community and your neighbors because they might be concerned about some of the practices that you're using. So looking at population and, and your markets, what your competition is, where your niche could be, um, if you're doing things like livestock and you want to be looking at capturing some of the value added of selling direct to your customers, and I know more and more producers, regardless of scale, are looking at this as income generation, do you have the processing locally that you are going to need? Um, I think it's really important to talk with your health districts if you're doing value-added products, um, really understanding how they can assist you, what the rules are, and how those rules are interpreted. Because while rules are the same at the state level, sometimes there's a little bit different interpretation at the county level. And then what are the transportation patterns, especially if you're looking to move things to market, how easy is it going to be able to get to market? Or are there organizations like a distributor that you can work with to get your products to market? So there are a number of tools that are online that you can look at to kind of get a macro understanding of what's going on in the regions that you're looking. And so one of the things that you can do is look at this plant hardiness zone map. This is a USDA map and um, you'll have all of these slides and the links. So this is the link to that website. You just go in and you put in the zip code of where you're looking and then you're going to get the zone. And then you can go in and look at different information. There's interactive maps where you can also zoom in and look at different parcels. So it's important important to really know what the growing season is and if you're going to have to invest in season extension techniques or the like. Again, that results in um, thinking about your carrying costs. What is it going to cost to actually establish the systems that you want on your farm? The Census of Agriculture is another place you can find information and this drills down to the county level. How many of you have looked at the census of ag in terms of doing some type of land assessment. Anybody? Okay. Okay, great. Well, this is a good tool. So you can find out about the number of farms. You can find um, information about crops and livestock, like how many farms are producing this, what are the acreages in crops and livestock and certain production practices. 
you can include market information, including the number of farms that are selling direct from your county. Uh, there's a lot of information about farm economics and you can look at trends over time to see how farms are doing in that area. Generally, are they making more money? Or are they making less money? Real estate value of land and buildings can be found as well as operator demographics. Now with the census of ag, they do protect identity. So for instance, if you are looking to see how many certified organic farms are in a specific county, that's generally a number that it can be low in some counties. And so you might get something like a Z that you see in the ag census. And that's because there's not enough um, enough producers to keep their information confidential. So this is this is a good opportunity for you to find out about egg in these different areas and explore that pretty deep. So this is a link that takes you into looking at a quick county profile. It's an interactive map. So you just click on the county and it's going to give you information about that county in an you know, it's about a two page summary. And then you can, as I said, dial in and find a lot of the tables of deeper information, including what the ag rents are in that county. Looking to see if there's support for ag at the state level, you can really look at the ag tax policies, some of the farmland protection programs. We do not have them at the state level in Idaho, but other states do have them. Uh, the right to farm laws and where are, you know, where, where are those boundaries around municipalities and, you know, if you're running cattle, like, where is that line? I was in a, a conversation with farmers sometime in the last two weeks and one was talking about how they're, they had two cows that were hit and they were like hit like 20 feet from the line that right to farm line before going into a municipality where they wouldn't have been covered and that was like a, a really scary thing to happen because if those um, animals hadn't been protected by those like open range laws then they could have lost the investment in both of those animals so those things are really important to know also, if you're doing value added cottage foods laws and the food code is really important. And Janelle, I know you're looking at Washington or greater Spokane area in Idaho. And what you'll find is that the cottage food laws are much stricter in Washington than they are in Idaho. And producing under those laws, of course, you can't sell um, certain products across the state line because the laws are different. So those are things to really um, consider when you're looking at your market and where you want to locate. And then again, um, is agriculture included in the community plans? You know, what what is the history? And it doesn't mean that you don't want to find land there, but it may mean that if you want to do some innovative agricultural things on your land, like agritourism, you might have to work through more conditional use permits. You might have to really um, be talking with the county commissioners and others that are making those zoning uh, laws because you might even have to have some things changed for you to farm or you might have to fight for some things not to change so that you can continue your operation. We just have many, many places in Idaho that are rapidly urbanizing and we see those municipal boundaries, you know, essentially getting bigger. And so how close you are to them can really impact your agricultural operation in the future. Um, Moscow is a great city in Idaho. We actually have in our city code uh, provisions to do market gardening within the city limits and be able to sell from your property. So that's a really friendly place to do urban agriculture. So any comments or questions before we move on? I need to open the chat because I see there there's some comments in the chat. Okay, great. I'm going to point out a few places where you can find out about land values and prices. 
So the census of ag, as I mentioned, they do have uh, land values and they have rental values that they update annually. And they have that uh, drilled down to the county level. So that can be helpful for you to think about what would the average parcel be going for in terms of rental value. And as I showed, I believe it was last week, you can see that for irrigated acreage, for non-irrigated acreage, for pasture. And so definitely gives you a read, but ultimately there's a lot of other factors that are feeding into what that rental rate is. And we'll review those a little later tonight. The USDA Farm Service Agency that Jessica talked about as being a great partner, they can help you look at land values and prices. And I also believe that you could contact Northwest Farm Credit Services or other ag lenders and be talking to them. Many people are using the MLS listings, which are those realtor listings to look at ag values. And I think if you're looking at a smaller acreage, that's probably where you're going to get a lot of information about the trends. As Greg said, you know, you, he's been looking at those. But you can also work with local real estate agents. You know, one of the things about developing good um, relationships with real estate agents, if you find one that specializes in ag land and really understands agriculture, sometimes you might find about out about something that will come on the market before it actually gets listed in that MLS. So think about who's in the region, what those real estate agents are, and then for each company, look at how much ag land they deal with. And so if, if you can find someone that to work with, that would be great. You can also contact the State Department of Agriculture and ask them if they have some, some contacts in the area you're looking at and then talking to people within your community, um, making sure that you go in and talk to people in the planning and zoning office and to the, call the different land appraisers there. What I wanted to show you, this is a, from the National Ag Statistics Service, and this is the macro level on the state about changes in real estate value. So this isn't good information. You can drill this down to the county level, but what you can see here is that from 2019 to 2020, overall in Idaho, real estate values have gone up 3.7%. So that's being averaged across the state. So you can, um, and this is ag real estate values, so farmland specifically. But we know that that's going to be much higher in the area that Greg is looking up in the you know greater Kootenai County area, down in Moscow, Lataw County, and it is going up in the more rural areas, but not as fast. Um, how many of you watched uh, Nicole's land access story video? You could just raise your hand. A few people did. Okay, her video is really great because she talks about how she used county land assessments to drill in and find out information about parcels. So if you Google like I did today, Lata County land assessments, you, you get a map and you can dial into the map until you see the parcel numbers. And then when you click on the parcel number, you get information about the current value and the um, taxable property value. You also get information about who owns that property. So if you're like Nicole, she had been watching that ag land and seeing what happens with it and found some places that looked like they would suit her needs but hadn't been used for a while. So she went down and she found out who had them and she wrote him a letter and followed up. And I, I really feel that you have to be proactive and work hard on your own behalf to find land. And her video really shows how hard she worked, how she networked to, you know, really develop her community and how she used those relationships to find land. So I talked a little bit about rental rates. Again, you know, the National Ag Statistics Service has that information. You can also contact through University of Idaho Extension or the Extension offices within whatever state you're looking, your farm management specialists. And so down in um, Southeast Idaho, you might be contacting Ben Eborn 
or you might contact Ashley Westerhold. They're part of a farm management team and talk with them. They're gonna be connected with farmers. Again, building that network and your team to help you find land. Um, I already talked about local real estate agents. They might know about rental rates or people who have purchased land from them that would be willing to rent land. Uh, and then following up in some of the things like the classified ads. So this is just showing you the link where you go for the USDA National Ag Statistics data about those cash rents that I talked about. So you can use this direct link. So figuring out um, a good rental rate is really tricky. We talked some about that last week when we were talking about land. It can vary a lot based on the type of lease and who that landowner is and if it's a short term or longer term lease. We did talk last week a little bit about rollover leases and how in those types of leases, you if somebody doesn't want to depart from that relationship, it can roll over and um, Marcy talked about how in their land trust leases, they already set in there what the increase in the um, rental fee is going to be. So those are things that you're going to want to make sure that are really clear in your lease agreement. The marketplace does play an important role, but really this relationship you have with the landowner whose motivations are not always financial are really important in setting that rate. So you really do need to understand the landowner, landowner and have conversations with that person, developing a relationship with them and learning more about their motivations so that you can talk about those in the agreements that you're making about renting. So I think word of mouth is gonna be an important uh, source of information wherever you go and so definitely talk to all of the USDA offices. Make sure you talk to NRCS and FSA. They're in direct contact with farmers all the time. If your county has an ag agent, be talking to those people as well and ask for referrals. Um, different types of landlords. Again, we talked about this before, but they're going to have different um, requirements in terms of land access and they're going to have different priorities. So many reasons that landowners sell or lease, they might be financial, but they might be doing an estate or succession planning process. They may just be overwhelmed by property maintenance and really um, need assistance with that or be looking at not having as much property to manage. Um, they often want to qualify for their agricultural tax assessment, and that might be a motivation for them to lease. And they might have a mission that is really about supporting local food or food production. And so sometimes when you're finding land that's owned by a church or another nonprofit organization, that could be a motivator for them and the stewardship of natural resources. So just an overview of things that you can look at, uh, farm link programs. I know some of you are um, signed up on the Idaho farm link. Other states have farm link programs. Talking to your county extension educator, other farmers are key, knowing their networks. Look for farmer listservs and Facebook groups in the area that you are wanting to find the land. You might even go and talk to your extension educator about who's involved in 4-H and would any of those families that already have land and are connected to agriculture be willing to lease land to you. You can put information out on different listservs or um, track those. Whenever somebody comes to me and says that they have land to rent, I ask them for a description that I can send out on this Rural Roots listserv. So word of mouth, uh, the county assessor's office, again, is a great place to go. We talked about realtors. Craigslist, I'm not sure how much is on Craigslist right now. Uh, NRCS staff, the land trusts, and food and farm organizations. So again, this is really going to be about networking. And that's what it's going to take to find good land. 
So tapping into the real estate market and looking for an agent, I mentioned that already, but one of the things that I have noticed and one of the things that I was actually told by Realtor.com about two weeks ago is that most realtors will not show land unless they know you are pre-qualified. It's a really competitive environment right now. So you definitely will need to put those financial statements together. And this is kind of interesting because last week, Jessica talked about not necessarily, their model wasn't a pre-approval model. Their model was you came with like a contract or an option to buy. Well, that might not be in sync with the real estate market. So when you are making your um, contacts with your potential lenders, talk to them about that. What do I do if they ask for pre-approval? How are we going to negotiate that as a team? Um, Another thing is that I think oftentimes, you know, the pictures are to sell you the property. And so as you go into the land assessment process, you need to be mindful of what they aren't showing you. Um, it's kind of amazing right now how many people are buying land sight unseen in Idaho. Is that something, Greg, that uh, the realtors talk to you about? They they mentioned they did mention that um, you know but I obviously I'm never going to do that I feel right. like I have to walk the land right and uh, but thank you for the the links that you you've added in this deck but yeah they have talked about that that there are people um, in fact it's it's interesting I had a, a friend was looking in Spokane the same weekend we were in um, Idaho totally pre qualified put a contract in. And someone remotely bought bought the house, paid cash, and hadn't seen it, right? So the, unfortunately, there's a lot of out-of-state money moving in um, from places like California. So it's it's inflating pricing for sure. Right, absolutely. And you know, one of the things that I've noticed, I've lived in Moscow or the general area around Moscow for almost 30 years. And what was rural when I came here is not rural now. Like, you know, Deary is about 35 miles from here, a 45 minute drive. And when we were looking for our first house, we thought who would live out in Deary? Like, that's crazy. Now, the property values in Deary are, um, they are, really not that much different than when you get closer into Moscow. They are less, but it's still much more expensive than it's ever been. So uh, that makes me really think about areas that I've been looking at land with my son and kind of looking down in the Elk River, or not Elk River, but Elk City area. And, you know, that land is more expensive um, than it used to be, but in the Clearwater River Valley, it is less expensive than up in the Palouse area, but for how long? You know, I think we are a popular destination state. And so it may be that if you do decide that you find land that is more rural, that meets your needs, it may not always be more rural. That's, that's the nature of what we're seeing. So I really wanna emphasize it's important to build your community social network and you can do that you know, by right now online and connecting with community organizations, finding farmer organizations and joining those and reaching out and having conversations so that you're just really building relationships. And it's going to be helpful in building those to for people to know how serious you are, because we get a lot of inquiries like I, I want to find land to farm, but it's different when you have an inquiry where somebody has done pretty much no work and somebody who comes in and says, you know, I've, I've taken this class that was offered by extension. I went through the exercises. I'm really clear on my goals. I've like narrowed down on what I'm looking for. I have my financial statements in order. That's a really different conversation than a real beginning conversation. So this work you're doing can really help you, um, you know, show how serious you are and validate that you're somebody somebody should spend their time with in looking for land. And so I already talked about these different agencies. You'll have this in the notes so you can make your plan and when you're gonna contact them and check those off. 
I would just wanted to say a couple of things about Idaho FarmLink. We are right now evaluating the users of Idaho FarmLink. But one of the things that I have noticed when land seekers put in uh, inquiries to land owners about their land, generally speaking, they say something like, I'd like to know more about this property. Hmm. And one of the questions we're asking the landowners is, what is it that you want to see in a description and an introduction that somebody makes of themselves that would inspire you to go the next level to actually contact them? And I think, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that you, if you're using something like a, a farm link program that you need to write a book, but I do think that for those initial contacts, it would be important to really kind of describe what you're doing, some of your experience, you know, have a compelling statement about why that person would want to contact you and feel that that was a really good use of their time. Um, I actually am in communication with a couple in Spokane off of Washington Farm Link. Um, that that's what I did. I they had a more compelling um, list listing for me to have something to go off of. Mm. But when I introduced myself, I introduced myself and what I'm doing and what I hope to do and some of my values. And I, I kind of put it out there, um, what I was looking for and what skills I bring to the table and what I would see uh, using the land for and that has turned mine? into a courting relationship at this point um, which is cool that's great yeah. ah, that's exciting okay i have a discussion question so i'm going to stop sharing my slides for a while and this really came from the land requirements workshop and the question i'm posing to you is does the prior use of the land matter and if yes, why? I guess if no, why as well? So let's take a break from the slides and talk about that. So we think, yeah, it definitely does. Um, there was a couple things when I was working at Northwest, one of the things that we had to do when people purchased property was an environmental questionnaire. And so you've got to make sure that there were no environmental concerns, um, because if there are, there could be major problems later. The government could come back and fine you and whatever. But, you know, for us, we were looking at a piece of property the other day and, you know, we haven't contacted the landowner, but we were just kind of looking it over before we did and saw that there was some buried mainline and things from a previous use, but we didn't know exactly what was under the ground, you know, so it's so, so the the piece of property has had two pivots on it before um but the above ground structures are gone all that's left is the yeah. concrete center pad where the center pivot went um and the riser coming up out of the ground from the main line and mm -hmm. then you can see a few risers from hand lines that they had years ago before they put the center pivots on and so you know there might be things that you aren't aware of that you can't see that are under the ground electrical lines water lines things like that mm -hmm. and for us what we're looking for we're looking for as completely completely unimproved as we can find just so we don't have to pay for any extra costs or any extra improvements well yeah the improvements are the excavation of it and then another property we looked at has like a power line that runs through it that we don't we can't see why that power line would have been there so it's you kind of need to know what why was the purpose here is it something that can be removed or you know what what all plays into that so it definitely matters what's been there before for a lot of different reasons yeah i i agree and it, there could be an easement across that property related to that power line Greg, what about in, in your search? Were you looking at previous uses of land? I, yeah, I, I have and I, and I am. I mean, it's very important. And um, so for instance, I, I will be completely organic. I won't use any chemicals. And it's not like you can't heal the land, you can. Um, so for me, it's probably three years down the line before I'm planting. But 
if I bought something this weekend, uh, I'm planting cover crops on, um, you know, in spring. And, and I will do, you know, green manure with specific crops that pull, pull nutrients from deep and that I'll plow back in. And, and I will do that for two or three years. So that, that does matter um, how, how the land has been used. Um, you know, water rights is a big deal for me. You know, I don't understand. Uh, and, and I've asked this of several realtors and they can't tell me, well, what about Worley? You know, there's some beautiful land in Worley, but I don't know what happens with water rights there because it's on reservation ground. Mm. Um, could I have a pond? Can I retain water on my land because I don't want to just to be dependent on, you know, either city water or maybe a well that's, you know, it, it, it doesn't pull enough for what I need to, to. So there are things like that that are, are very important to me. Um, but like, like you said, I will have to compromise somewhere. And as long as it's something that I can fix and uh, I'm just trying to avoid surprises, you know, that's, you know, that's yeah. the big deal for me because if I, if I know this happened, but I have a heads up on it, I can plan for that. Yeah, exactly. So will you be then talking to the tribe, the tribe itself about their land use rules? You... Yeah, if I end up there's there's a spot in Plummer right now that I really, I really like, and it even already has a pond on it. Mm -hmm. So I have to assume that I, I don't want to assume anything. That's the wrong, the wrong <laughs> word. But you know, I, I'm hoping that 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 was already taken care of with the last owner. But I will track it back if that's the one that we zero in on. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I will talk to them. And the the tribe actually hosts a Thursday farmers market in Plummer. The One Sky One Earth Food Coalition is uh, a tribal based food coalition, and they host a Thursday farmers market. So yeah. there is a, there is support for local agriculture within the tribe, and they're really interested in food security. And so just to you know to know that. Yeah. Thank you. And there's an extension educator, Shana Nomi, who is with the Coeur d'Alene tribe that is somebody that you could talk to because she would know who else to talk to. Oh, okay. In, in the tribe. Like she's not an ag educator. She's in, she's involved with um, another U of I person that manages that, uh, that little market. But there's a, a woman who actually, I'm kind of going in the weeds a little bit to help you network. But if you talk to Shana, there's another woman. Her name is... Uh, Becky and she works in the commodity food program and runs the community garden and has done a lot of gardening classes and she's got a farm background so she's she would be a great person to talk to about that property in the community and again to network you into some of the people that could answer your questions. Okay. And Greg in the chat I put a link to her contact information for you. Oh. Oh, excellent. Great. Thanks, McKinnon. Great. Uh, Danelle or Melinda, do you want to? Um, yeah, I don't have much to add. I suppose um, I think something Tyler and Leah were driving at was okay, sometimes the history of the land also having to either fix something that's in disrepair or that was poorly done to begin with is almost not worth it. So I think I see what they were driving at there. Um, another consideration that I would add to that that's important to me is what's going on in the land surrounding me, um, particularly out on the Palouse or in one of those areas where there's a lot of large uh, like grain crops and I'm worried about spray drift. I, I think that's a good point. Did I tell you the story about the farm that I, the berry farm that I visited? So I, I visited a berry farm, it's a five acre berry farm, and it was not in Idaho, it was actually in Washington. And um, beautiful, and they had a U-pick, they had a really good location, had a little processing um, center on that. But when I was doing a walk of the farm, I got to the perimeter and the neighbor had horses and a horse pasture that was really dry. It wasn't enough land for the horses. And so when the wind picked up, everything 
you know, all the dust and the dirt and the feces, whatever was in that horse pasture would blow right into that farm, that little berry farm that was a you pick and you can't really wash raspberries. And, you know, and so like thinking of what they actually needed to put in there for a food safety standpoint would be to create a barrier between them and their neighbors. So mm -hmm. totally agree, Janelle, it's just so important to look at what your neighbors are doing and how water flows, how, what the airflow is going to be, um, what those land uses are or might be based on zoning. So great. Thanks for sharing, everyone. I'm going to go back to our slides. Did you have something to add, David? Before oh, I'm sorry, on? David. Oh, I was just going to say that I, I said I would say yes, too, because I had a uh, 100 acres of fields I put in that failed this spring. And if I was on my own, I'd be out out of business. It, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I think has been learned over the last 20 years is that there's more residual from herbicides than we thought in some of the land in that if something has been in a grass crop like wheat and you want to do a broadleaf crop, you can have some effects on your crop and vice versa. And then another thing that we found is that sometimes if people have used a municipal based compost in, a, in their, you know, if it's a small market garden area and they've used something like that, that can also have residuals. And um, I can tell you from experience that my garden has been struggling for about five years because I used, a, 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 it was a source I'd used from before. I felt really good about it, but there was something in there and it's not good. Okay, so thanks for, definitely thank you all for sharing. So I've, I've talked about all of these land values. I really think these trends in rural land ownership and distance from towns and cities with amenities is something that is driving the cost of land. And um, I was a little disheartened by Jessica's uh, perspective last week that probably land values are not going to decline that this trend is probably going to be a consistent trend and that while we don't know if they're going to increase a lot in the next couple of years, they probably we're probably not seeing a, a high blip in the market. So setting the price, we talked about this a little bit before, but I think it's also really important as we talked about to know your credit score, have your financial statements up to date and be able to share your business plan. And then think about those services that you can provide that add value and will work for you within the operation that you're doing because your time is money. And so if you are going to do any services, you have to make sure that that's a fair return on your time investment and whatever equipment that you need to use to do that. So beyond a great vision is a plan. And here are some of the resources that I have mentioned in other classes for business planning. Again, um, you'll be able to access all of these. And I just wanted to point out that many of these are free. This Farming Alternatives book we have used in our Cultivating Success classes for many years. Diane has been an instructor of this class many times. It is a great resource. Uh, that has many worksheets. So they're simple, straightforward, they explain concepts, but it's really process oriented to help you think through a lot of different things about your operation. Uh, this is the book I mentioned about holistic management that I, I just love at home with holistic management. It's $20, so pretty affordable. Uh, in the classroom, you have a link to the Financial Fitness for Farmers webinar series, and uh, that goes into each one of those financial statements that we've talked about in detail. And then this book, Building a Sustainable Business, is online free, again, with many worksheets and um, assessment tools that you can use as you develop your business plan. I mentioned that there was a step-by-step -step way that you could do Ag Plan by creating an account so you can develop a business plan. It's here, Ag Plan with the University of Minnesota. So as I said, that's confidential to you, but you create an account, you put in your information, you can print your plan at the end, and you can go back at any time to update it. 
if you're somebody that likes templates a, a lot more, you can go to ATRA, which is Ag Technology Transfer for Rural Areas. And they all of their publications now are free with the pandemic. And they have a lot of things about production as well. It's a really great resource, but they do have business templates. Your small business development center is going to have consulting services. Sometimes those people have information about agriculture and sometimes they don't, but they often will review a business plan. So that could be helpful. And then these are the links to the main pages for Northwest Farm Credits, Ag Vision Program, and the Farm Service Agency. So those will all be in the slide deck that you can check out. Uh, Jessica mentioned the Finding Farmland Calculator, and Tyler and Leah said that they used this calculator last week, so I wanted to just show you and provide you the link for it and say that they have a lot of online tutorials, a lot of resources, and then you can create your calculator in this scenario. Any questions or comments before we move into talking about land assessment? That's very helpful, Colette. Okay. Good. I'm glad. So I just um, wanted to. Oh, go I was ahead. Just, I was just going to say the, the holistic management international has a lot of really good um, resources as well. Resources on their website. They 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 are surprisingly generous with what they give for free. That's great. On there as well. Yeah. So. Um, I am, I'm going to keep moving because we did talk about this a little bit, but this uh, land comparison worksheet, I just wanted to point out that some of the things that I've talked about that you can find in NAS and everything, this worksheet guides you through places that you can put that information when you're building that comparison. So let's move into talking about land assessment. It's really the way that you're evaluating the property in the context of the neighbors in the community. And you're really wanting to inventory your natural resources and the physical characteristics of that land, its existing infrastructure, and documenting its historic and current land use for all those reasons that we talked about in our discussion and more. And then evaluating the site and the setting in, in terms of those community considerations. And as well, if you're thinking about leasing, thinking about that relationship with the landowner, if that person is nearby, if it's multiple landowners in a situation that a property is owned by a family, how you would connect with those. But it's really understanding as much as you can about the land before you actually uh, enter into an agreement to purchase or lease it. And it really needs to look at these carrying costs that we're talking about. So the, there's the cost of your lease, there's the cost of your payment on your land, but then there's all the costs of, of what you need to do to operate that your enterprise on that land. So infrastructure, property taxes, utilities, those types of things are your carrying costs. So in doing a land assessment, you want to look at the pros and cons of the specific sites that you think are going to work for you and really ascertain whether it's compatible with the kind of farming or ranching that you want to do. And if it does have limitations, can you overcome those limitations or are they a deal breaker? So overall, your property is going to have to fit in with your personal financial and business goals. And like we've talked about, Every, every farmer that I've talked to has some things that they would like to be different about their property, but uh, they are working with what they have and, you know, they're making it successful. And we really saw that with Emily. This is Reverie Farms right here. This is outside of Moscow in the, the Troy area, and they produce medicinal herbs and have moved in the last couple of years into putting a processing facility on the farm. So Janelle, this might be a great farm for you to network with. They are growing organically and looking at certified organic. And so um, Karen Chanaki is the owner just a really wonderful person and you know 
her and her husband found a nice piece of property with a pond, a place they can establish an orchard to have more crops. But as you can see, they're right next to conventional agriculture. So they are having to, you know, look at producing on a piece of property and they want to move towards certified organic and they're going to be mitigating uh, and having to create some most likely buffer here and be looking at some other issues because of surrounding land use. So when you assess a site, you want to collect as much information as you can. You can get maps and photos, um, definitely visiting, talking to people, talking to neighbors, others in the community. Uh, within the area that you're looking at land, who are those experts that you can consult with? And if you're looking at a couple different counties, then you're going to be really looking at connecting with the technical assistance providers in multiple regions. And then it's really important to document what you find, you know, use a checklist, use photos, because it's going to be hard to remember, especially if you're doing a comparison. And then making sure that you perform due diligence to the extent that you can. So we're going to look at several key features to access or to assess one by one. So location and configuration of the land. And so we talked a bit about weather. We talked about um, whether it's accessible. Is it accessible all year round? The distance to services, the different, the distance to market. Um, if there's not housing associated with the property, is housing in the area affordable? Thinking about that into your overall ability to afford that land. And are the neighbors friendly towards agriculture? And then another thing to think about is the size, shape, and configuration of the fields. And when you're looking at neighboring land use and cover, this particular farm is up above Orofino, and you can see they're feeding fodder to their cattle. They also have pigs. Well, when they initially bought this piece of property, they have about 30 acres, and they were able to lease from a neighbor. So they had a lot more land to run their cattle on. That neighbor sold the property, and the new neighbor is really clear. They don't want any of those cows on their property. So they went from a situation of being able to have a, an affordable lease arrangement and to have their herd to having to think about how are we going to feed these animals on a lot less land. So they um, did a lot of investigation and they bought a, a, um, a chamber where they make fodder, which is their our sprouting feed and it has a really high nutritional quality and is affordable. I've seen people do this with poultry as well. So fun, a fun thing to look at if you're looking at raising poultry or animals, but they had to ch change some of their system when they lost access to land. Uh, looking at the health and condition of your natural resources and uh, what are the soils like? How have they been treated? Are you going to be able to grow what you would like to in that soil? Uh, we talked a lot about water. We, and it's really important to look at water quality and quantity because you may have a water, a water source, let's say it's a surface water source that you can use early in the season. But as you move towards harvest, you really need to be using water that you know is not contaminated by any animal feces, that it's going to be of um, the quality required so that if it touches the edible portion of your crop, that crop is safe in terms of food safety. Um, looking at the topography, how water and air moves on your property that you're looking at, are there going to be cold spots? Um, are there lows? Uh, looking at what's surrounding and if you're going to have to invest in infrastructure to keep out predators, that could be something that could have quite a high carrying cost, but it, you could also have um, some seclusion from other types of intrusions on your property or privacy that you want. You could have habitat for beneficial insects, for birds that could really be assets to your farm. And then are there some um, types of rights to the land, like mineral rights, that could impede your use in the future if anybody else has those rights? And one of the things that I wanted to show in this picture, this is actually in the Newman Lake area. So just on the Washington-Idaho border by 
uh, in the Spokane Valley area. So between Spokane and Coeur d'Alene. And this is the most rocky soil that I have ever seen. And I went to two farms that were farming on the soil and it was beautiful. Their, their produce is amazing. And they were had great production systems. Uh, they're on an irrigation district, so they had a lot of water. You might be able to see some of that equipment in the background. But in terms of soil suitability, it's not a soil that I would have necessarily looked at and thought, oh, wow, that's going to be um, great to, to grow in. But it does work for them. So Mackenzie, I can't follow the chat why I'm going through the slides. So if things come up that people want to share, I should address, let me know. Janelle just mentioned how um, it's not as much of a concern for the inland Northwest area, but flooding is a really big issue where she is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and maybe Diane will share some, um, you know, we have standing water, we have springs, we do have flooding um, in a lot of creeks, rivers. So I don't think it's like it is where you are, Janelle, but it is a concern in a lot of areas. I'm, I was primarily thinking of when um, large livestock operations have gotten mm -hmm. flooded out and contaminated water. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a little bit about infrastructure and improvements. We talked about housing. Um, are you going to be able, if, if it doesn't come with housing, are you going to be able to site and, and put the type of housing that you want on that property? Uh, where you would place buildings, barn sheds, and hoop houses, or if they're there and what it would take uh, in terms of investment and time and money to make those usable. <laughs> I see that Leah's nodding her head, something that they're well acquainted with. Um, look at, at the farm roads and driveways. And this is definitely something that may be pretty expensive if you have to maintain uh, a, a road into your property. Uh, there's a piece of property right now up in Bonner County that is for sale. So that's outside of Sandpoint where Diane is. And it has a 35 minute Jeep road drive to get to it. So you can imagine what some of the costs would be of maintaining that road. And in the pictures that the realtor put up, there is a sign that says that maintenance of the road is private. So that kind of gives you a clue. You got to think that if you buy that, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to maintain that road to get in and out. So just thinking about things like that. And sometimes those um, fees are shared between landowners if you're going into a rural area. But what is that relationship? How, how are those things being split? And is that agreement a verbal or a written agreement within that housing community is important to know. So fencing. Uh, conservation practices, if they're on there, if they're mandated, really looking at the condition of the irrigation systems, wells, um, making sure that you get a well water test, that you write those, the, any type of evaluation that you want to do of soils or water, septic systems into your um, agreement of things that need to actually, I can't remember exactly what they're called on it. An agreement, but there's stipulations that those are things that um, have to essentially meet a certain standard before you would be obligated to buy the property. So, you know, those things. Um, Colette? Yes? With that, if you can go back real quick. Sure. Um, so, another thing with like water systems that, um, especially with a lot of you guys, how you're looking at like a smaller property um to watch out for would be like joint use agreements where there's a well and it looks like it's part of your property but really it's like shared with the neighbor even if it's on your property like maybe the neighbor's relying on it so that's like a good question is you know is anybody else or any other properties using this well um and if so you know the joint use agreement agreement a lot of banks will require that like at northwest we did mm -hmm. um and we would have to have those spelled out um, and it basically said if something happens who's responsible or what percentage are we responsible to pay the um, repairs or you know if it totally fails but that's something to really watch out especially on the smaller parcels adjoining each other because you know maybe the farmer owned this I mean like our place here you know we just are renting the farm but the well is for the Corrells his grandpa's house across the driveway and our house and you wouldn't necessarily know that unless you asked. 
and sometimes they wouldn't really tell you either. So good to know. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, another thing, Mackenzie and I are involved in a research project right now looking at scaling up fruit and vegetable production in the Palouse region. And, you know, we're on aquifer systems here. And what some aquifer systems are seeing is that they're declining. And what's the land use going to be in the long term? Because you might start out with having a certain amount of water, but if it's groundwater and it declines due to overuse of the aquifer, you can still um, be severely affected by that and you can that can change the whole water table. We have other farmers that we work with up in the the Santa area which is pretty rural in uh, Benawa County so it's about it's over an hour from here and they come to our market. They um, are surrounded by timberland and it's was really it was harvested really heavily in the last several years and their water table has dropped. So there's so many things that influence water, some of them outside of your control. And definitely things to con consider as you're, you're thinking about where to place your, your farmer ranch. So we talked a little bit about land cover and use, about what it's been in the past. Um, is it under active management now? This is really interesting. This is a farm that's out by Orofino and it was originally a hunting lodge and the lodge is really destroyed um, by um, a, a lot of ne neglect. But, you know, this is a, a piece of property where the buildings were not functional, but the property was functional for other things. And so the farmers that bought it are having, they cannot renovate that building. They actually use it as a shop, but for many reasons, it will never be safe for habitation. And so they had to build a separate dwelling on this property. So thinking about nest restoration and just really looking closely at those previous land uses. We've talked a little bit about property rights and potential limitations, but again, just making sure that um, there's no other rights to that land or if, if there are, that those are very clearly spelled out and you understand how those could affect your property use. And then, um, I, I can't say enough, especially if you're going to be in kind of an urban area to look at those local laws, including zoning and health codes for what it is you want to do. And especially where your market is, because a lot of times people that are on state lines find that they could have a pretty good market in the neighboring state, but some of those uh, Idaho codes, Washington codes prohibit moving things across that state line and having being able to access that market. So again, it's important to include these carrying costs in uh, any of your financial assessments. Make sure that you're thinking about them when you're developing your your cash flow statements and you're putting your enterprise budgets together. Some of them might be directly associated with your production system, but many of them are going to be the costs that you're going to need to divide up and allocate to those different enterprises on your farm. So a certain portion of them. So they're really um, key for you looking at whether or not you can move towards a positive return on your investments in your farm operation. And then we've talked about community support for ag and the comprehensive plans. Um, you know, are there policies that are looking at prioritizing agriculture in farmland? And how does the community really support local farms and ranches? And you can really see that in whether or not there's farmers markets, if there's farm to table restaurants, you know, generally, how does the community look at agriculture? And if you wanna have a local market, is that market in, align with, in alignment with what you want to produce? And so I've done some research on markets, specifically looking at restaurants and retail. And what we found is that it's really those more urbanized towns that have a high 
a more visible local food scene that are open to purchasing things that might be more novel or different in terms of ag products. But we have found that there's a lot of interest in more rural communities that are smaller, but they're more interested in buying the types of products that they see every day. So where they might not be interested in an heirloom tomato, they might be interested in a tomato that looks very similar to the one at the grocery store. So those are things to think about when you're thinking about what you want to produce and whether or not you have a local market for that. Yeah, it's a great point, Colette, because we, we went into grocery stores um, for that purpose, like a dozen, right? And, and it is very interesting because I personally, I would rather have an heirloom tomato, right? I would rather plant and grow things that people just aren't growing. I would rather grow a kohlrabi than a carrot. Right, I just, I want unique, I, whatever, but the market isn't always of the same mindset. Yeah, I have a friend up in Omac. Uh, she actually just moved to uh, Vashon Island, but she's been living in Omac for a number of years and she's from the Republic area. And she, the farmer's markets up there, she was actually the farmer's market manager up there this last season. And yeah, absolutely. Like the, even, the, the the conventional farmers kind of are king still in those in those rural areas yeah i think and i think things are changing but what the customer is looking for is something to really understand if that fits with how you want to produce your land i mean what you want to produce that's on certainly your land. not a dig yeah and that's certainly not meant to be a dig sure. at conventional farming by any means just that that's that's just the truth that's how it shakes out yep so um, and I think sometimes you are going to want to have uh, professionals come and visit the land. So if you find a piece of land or a couple of pieces, it, it's really worth your time to hire somebody that can come and look at that. And that is one of the types of things that Diane does as an experienced farmer. So I'm just going to get through a couple more slides and then we can hear some stories of her going out and visiting land and her farmer perspective. So I just wanted to say, it's a, you know, we talked a little bit about maps. You can get Google Maps and you can get distance maps. And so if you're thinking about, you know, living in salmon and you're processing in your livestock processing is in Pocatello or, you know, you're living in out in Laytaw County in rural Laytaw County, but your main market is in Moscow, you can figure out what those miles are and start to think about what's the transportation cost going to be? What's my fuel going to be? What's my time going to be to every market that I want to go to or to my different centers where I'm going to source my materials or I'm going to process my livestock? These are all part of that planning of what the cost of doing businesses and these types of maps can be helpful in looking at what your options are. On in the Google Classroom, there's a tutorial on how to use the web soil survey and that's going to give you information on the soils almost every every parcel of land that we have in the United States at some time was evaluated and information is in the web soil survey. It's a great tool. It can be a little complex sometimes. So viewing that about half hour video is going to be really helpful when you go to navigate it. And then um, at this URL right here, you're going to be able to find this publication and it goes very specifically through things to look at when you're evaluating land. So I encourage you to look at this and then it has a checklist at the end of it that you can use when you're doing that land evaluation. And um, so it's looking at, at things like slope and and different attributes of the land very specifically. So suggest that you look at that. Any questions before I hand it over to Diane? Okay, great. Okay, Diane, I'm going to transfer this over to you. Just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. So I want to say that uh, Diane Green has been an amazing mentor to me for about 30 years. Um, I'll never forget, Diane, how many times you told me to speak up. <laughs> she knew me in my early 20s. <laughs> and um, 
Diane is also a co-founder of the Cultivating Success Program and has been a farmer mentor to numerous farmers uh, on her farm and through that program. And I, I just really value your experience and appreciate your sharing it with us tonight. Well, I'm happy to be here. I love that we can do this from our homes these days and glad that we started doing Zoom before COVID happened. I, I'll tell you right off the bat, I'm not at my best because I think I have COVID. I'm going in to get checked tomorrow, so we'll go from there. But um, aside from that, I first of all wanted to congratulate you guys on making taking the effort to take a, a, a class like this and gather the information because so many people don't. And the more you know, the better off you are. So I'm sure it's overwhelming sometimes in the search for land, but um, I'm, I congratulate you on taking this first step because you know, you'll have a better opportunity of success by starting out with uh, good information and an um, informed-based toolbox that you're building here. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm going to turn off my video just because we're limited broadband here, but um, you see me. That's good enough. You don't need to see me anymore. <laughs> I'll turn it back on when we go for questions. So um, Green, Green Tree Naturals, it, we were established in 1992 and we're one of the oldest certified organic farms in the region. We grow certified organic vegetables, herbs, flowers that we sell at our farm stand through a small CSA. Um, we do some wholesale to restaurants and a local natural food store. And I started out at the farmer's market and sold at the farmer's market for 28 years and just retired from that last year. So we, it was good timing for us to shift to the farm stand and that's been uh, my customers followed me here to the farm, and that's been a nice transition. We also grow a few seed crops that we sell to a seed company in southern Idaho, Snake River Seeds. And in the spring, we sell vegetable and herb plants grown in uh, a 96-foot greenhouse that we have here. We use all kinds of season extension techniques to minimize risk from the ever-changing weather that here in North Idaho, but I, I think the weather's pretty much changing everywhere. It's, you can just figure that it's going to be extreme no matter what. But we include uh, road, row covers, hoop houses, low tunnels, high tunnels, shade cloth, uh, the greenhouse, black weed mat, and transplants plant using cold tolerant varieties for our crops. We've grown and sold meat birds, chickens and turkeys over the years and always have a flock of 25 layers and sell just enough eggs for them to pay for themselves and the dog and cat food and keep us in supply. We used to grow more chickens, but I've found over the years of teaching a lot of these sustainable ag programs, I've created a pretty good competition for myself. So there's more and more people doing egg layers. So we've kind of backed off on that and I think one of the crucial things for being successful as a small acreage farmer is adaptability. And I think that's with COVID happening, I think that adaptability is a really important part of what we do as well. We rotate our flock every two and a half years. And um, the when we get new chicks, which we'll be doing this spring, we turn the, um, old laying hens into sausages or chicken stock or whatever, just for our own purposes. We've contemplated integrating livestock into our farming system, but we've decided instead to support local farmers and resource our beef and pork from our neighboring growers instead. And we've had goats on and off for years. And I really, really like goats, but not for milking. We've just had them for pets for manure because they have really good manure and we may get them again, but that's uh, yet to be seen. Next slide, please. When I started to look for land, 
um, to purchase the idea of growing a large garden. Initially, I was thinking about doing a plant, a native plant nursery, but I knew I'd be growing vegetables too. We really didn't do a lot of planning uh, in, in the process, but I initially found the land by myself uh, as a single person. And I already had the skills to evaluate the land because of my background working for the Forest Service. I did 20 years with the Forest Service before I followed my passion to grow food. And my work with the Forest Service was assessing the landscape, doing timber stand exams. So I, I knew plant identification and uh, a lot of different things about the soils and was able to find, because of that, I was able to find the perfect property to meet my needs. But initially in that search, I enlisted a real estate person to show me properties for sale here in Sandpoint. I moved here from Avery, which is where I was working for the Forest Service, population 148 miles from the nearest grocery store. So I was pretty isolated and wanted to move to the big city of Sandpoint. Ha! Uh, the realtor would take me to a property and be anxious to show me the house. And the house was the last thing I would look at. I'd go out with my compass and shovel and in hand and walk the property, assessing the lay of the land and the plant species growing there and digging around in the soil and eva evaluating the slope and the aspect. And the realtor told me she had never seen anyone do that before. And after looking at a dozen or so properties, I ended up finding the property that became Green Tree Naturals 33 years ago without the aid of a real estate person. And I, I wanted to integrate as you're, I mean, it's good to use a real estate person, absolutely, but also know that in the, in the process when I was looking, I just kind of started looking everywhere in the part in the area around Sandpoint that I was interested in living. And I ended up finding an abandoned farmhouse that had a closed gate at the end of the driveway. And you could tell that no one had been here for a long time because the the brush and grass was growing up in the driveway. And uh, I used to drive past this place all the time. Finally, one day I stopped and walked up the hill to where the house was. And I, I just knew this was for me. And I tracked down the owner by looking at, looking up the, the power, the information on the power line and tracking them down that way. So know that it doesn't necessarily have to come from a realtor. You can do a search on your own and, and that certainly worked out well for me in that search. So this is um, a Google Earth overview, which came, I, I'm amazed that they do that so often, but this is 2019. Um, I met my future husband only four weeks after I found this land that we call home. And we built our lives around growing food for ourselves and our community. We have a little over 11 acres. Half of it is timber with pasture for our growing site, which is two and a half acres on a south slope. So we're pretty isolated with timber on both sides. So that, that kind of protects us from drift, it protects us from the wind, and th those were, I was looking for a south-facing slope, and that was really important to me. When you look at this photo, you can see what um, looks like an alien landing strip there. That circle garden is what is what we started with. And That's my favorite part of that picture. <laughs> and <laughs> that we started with that because we um, were growing just vegetables for ourselves, and we had a rain bird in the center of that. My heritage is Oklahoma and Native American, so I designed it as a medicine wheel. But we knew that we would be expanding on that, so we did cover cropping on um, areas all around that circle. And over the course of the 30 years that we've been growing, we um, expanded, but we started out by doing, like Greg was talking about, that's a great idea, and just planning ahead. We, we didn't really know what we were going to do, but we planned ahead enough to do cover crops in, in all the surrounding areas and slowly built up and moved our fences out a little bit at a time. But uh, ideally, we started small and worked our way up. And, and I'll talk more about that. 
our well was, I, I met the man that used um, the witching wands that hand dug our well. <laughs> um, he, and he's become a, uh, an, uh, a neighbor and uh, he is a neighbor and friend. But he, he said he hand dug the well in 1975 and he dug down 30 feet until he hit water. And when it started pouring in, he put in concrete casings and called it good. And we water, we've had our well tested. We, we tested every, about every three, four years and it's always been good, good source. So, and part of that is we don't really have neighbors or anyone around us too close, but we water two and a half acres all day, every day during the summer season and have never run out of water. So we think we must've tapped into some kind of our artesian aquifer and we're really grateful for that we will likely as water becomes more of an issue across the state we'll probably look into what is required for water rights i know the southern part of the state has some different issues with water rights than the northern part of the state but it's inevitable that that will be happening up here i've been offering education and guidance, moral support, and encouragement through Green Tree Naturals mentorship program since 1997. And I started offering this consulting service about 15 years ago after so many people were calling with questions on how to find a farmland and how to manage the land they have. And the bottom line was, you know, I'm, I'm a working farm, so that means I'm working all the time. So I generally would give someone 15 minutes of my time, but they'd want hours worth so that was what created the consulting service but i've worked closely with a lot of people who want to begin farming or diversifying their current operation as well as small acreage farmers looking for ways to increase profitability on their farm and i'd say most of the people that have hired me for a consultation after they've already purchased the land but some are looking direction like finding the best site for a garden or a greenhouse or helping them design um, their market garden or garden layout or wanting suggestions and advice for a more integrated approach to sustainable production methods. So it's been a, a, a mix of a lot of things. And I can say that I've done more land evaluations in since um, COVID came about and people are really looking to relocate than I've ever done before. I mean, this spring, usually I'll only do two or three a year. And I did um, nine of them before May this year. Next slide, please. So I, I think, and I sat in on all of what Colette was sharing there and it was really a lot of great information and I can only imagine that the previous weeks have been um, very worthwhile information gathering for you guys and this is probably a little bit of a repeat but I, I felt it's one of the things that I always um, do with my site assessments when I go to someone's farm and it's really important to take a close look at the physical and natural resources of the land just as Colette said, if you want a healthy functioning ecosystem on your farm or ranch, you really need to think about providing a home and habitat for not only the farm animals, but also the pollinators, um, the predatory insects, the earthworms, and all of the microbiology that drive that ecosystem function there. And that's really something to look at. The soil, well, everything we do on the farm is driven by the goal of continuing to grow and protect our soil structure and the soil health. And whether you're growing crops or pasture for feeding li livestock, it all begins with the soil. So that soil web survey that Colette was referring to is really a, a good way to identify those soil types because the soil is ancient and it doesn't change a lot. Well, it, it depends on what has been going on with that property that you're looking at. And that 
slope and aspect. Well, that's the, the, the site's aspect is simply the land's angle or orientation with respect to the sun. And I suspect you've already gone through this, but it's always good to hear things more than once. And a, a sun facing slope, which is what I was looking for when I was looking for land, because we have a south facing slope, will obviously receive significantly more direct solar radi radiation than a shaded slope. And the aspect and slope can affect its susceptibility to erosion, to frost pockets, um, the diversity and density of plant communities, the soil moisture, and more. I mean, it, it will, a, a southern facing slope is going to dry out sooner. So a lot of different aspects there. And it just depends on what you want to do. And you may have, a, depending on how much land that you're investing in, you may have a variety of aspects on that parcel of land. And each of those aspects may be well suited to different crops than the other. The um, vegetation cover and habitat type, that's one of the things that I always look closely at. And the habitat type is really the different species of plants growing together. And it's, it's pretty common that those same species grow together and a lot of different species of plants indicate wet sites, um, they and specific species are also indicators of dry sites. And I think with um, when you're looking at forested area and if you have forested area around you and I know uh, a, a couple different people I know here in the Sandpoint area that wanted to get into farming livestock ended up buying land that was forested not really think, I mean, they bought it because the price was right, but in, in our neighborhood, when I teach workshops on pest control, I include cougars, bears, wolves, coyotes as a part of, part of that pest control. And there's a, um, a young farmer up the road from us that has ended up losing she wants to raise sheep and she loses sheep every single year. Her lambs, she loses almost every year to um, cougars or bears. So that vegetation and forested area around you are something that you, is, is a good thing to think about. And then the water, well, water source obviously is crucial for growing plants or livestock and many locations across the state, there are a lot of water use restrictions and you, if you end up using city water for a source that they're often going to charge you per gallon over that certain allotment. So, and I, I have another farmer friend that's found that um, it's been very, very expensive for her to maintain and water as she's would like to. So she's learning to do some change her growing system in a way that she will use less water. And then if you have to dig a well, well, that, that can be very costly. And if you have a, a creek or stream, it may be seasonal. So that's a good thing to look at. And we, we certainly consider ourselves lucky to have found an artesian water source because our next door neighbor had to go 250 feet for their water. And then climate, well, Colette provided resources for assessing the USDA Ag Research Service plant hardest, hardest, harding, hard, oh, I can't even say that, hardiness zone map. And it's also important to know that there may be many microclimates uh, at most sites. I mean, we have different microclimates on, on our land because of the trees and how the sun shades certain areas, creates frost pockets. I've uh, provided a few land assessments for people who were looking to buy land after my evaluation and they decided not to buy it. Uh, last year I did a, a site evaluation and this is, goes with that for sale sign underwater. I did a site elevate, uh, evaluation for a young man who was so excited to have found reasonably priced 10 acres with great access. But after walking the site and identifying the plant species, uh, uh, along with a web soil survey, it was pretty clear that the entire parcel was going to be swamped for two or three months in the springtime. 
I mean, 75% of the soils at the location were identified as wet meadow, um, not exactly suited for growing the field crops that he wanted, which, which is one of the reasons why that land was affordable. He, he wondered if he could just bring in loads of topsoil and get a bulldozer to come in and rearrange the la land mass and to make it something farmable, which certainly is not a sustainable way to go. And I think it's always a good idea to do that web soil survey. And I always do one with the consultations, but um, I also think it's an important note to say that when using a realtor, at least this is what I've learned from talking to multitudes of people searching for land. Anytime a realtor says it shouldn't be a problem, that's a red flag. You make note of anything they say shouldn't be a problem and that's what you investigate. You delve into and spend a little extra time on because while they may be looking out for your best interest, they are, I mean, not to put realtors down at all because they can be very, very helpful, but they are looking to sell property and make some money. So um, that's, that's my thought about that. I love realtors. If anybody, anybody's a realtor, don't feel bad about it. But <laughs> <laughs> so whether you're looking to buy land or already have purchased land, there are a number of important decisions that you need to make related to what's what you're going to do with the land and how you're going to accomplishment. It can be very challenging to recognize the complicated web of details involved, but this course is certainly going to help you with that. But before making decision, it's really important to consider a few major factors that interact and influence each other. Next slide, please. So, and I, I know this is a part of this course, is what are your personal goals for the land? And Certainly the goals that you set for managing your, your land are more sustainably must be realistically, you must realistically consider the feelings of everyone in the family, your financial situation and the farm related talents of family members. And you need to be really clear on that. In the last couple of years with so many new landowners moving into North Idaho, I've done more consultations, like I said, most of the new landowners have come from warmer climates. Oddly, like California, Florida, or Texas have been most of the um, land assessments that I've done. And they're really often lacking perspective of just what living in our extreme four season climates is about. Um, most of the time people searching for land are doing so during the summer months without clearly considering the challenges that come with severe weather climate of our region. And it, we're pretty close to Canada, so it does snow a lot here. One family from Florida purchased 80 acres of a beautiful picturesque site at 3,000 feet elevation with questionable access for at least four months of the year due to snowpack and spring road breakup. And there, I always ask, what is your goal? And their goal was to live a more sustainable lifestyle and be able to grow all their own food. Uh, they, they did buy this land sight unseen, like um, Greg was talking about, and that is I'm seeing that a lot. And the bottom line is, I think it's a commendable goal to wanna to live a more sustainable lifestyle. However, there is a certain skill set that goes with that. They, they were surprised to hear that they couldn't grow peaches or lemons um, and disappointed to learn that there were limitations for what foods they could grow in this hardiness zone that really only provide where they were. It was only about 90 days of frost-free conditions. So I provided them with a list of vegetable species that they could would be able to grow and encourage them to use season extension techniques to ensure success. And they, um, on their list of goals, they were also interested in growing their own beef, chicken and pork for meat, although neither of them had ever been around livestock. And my job as a consultant is to provide a reality check. And I often, in hindsight, we'll say 
people often end up being um, RI affected, which means stands for reality impairment because they just, I mean, it's, it's fine. They have an idea of what they want, but they're not really thinking through the reality of what they want to do. So with this couple from Florida, I explained some of the basic concepts of what's involved with growing livestock from including fencing and infrastructure like a barn or pole shed for storing feed and providing protection in the, in the, the, from the elements in the winter. And when I asked how they felt about raising a pig or a chicken or from a baby and then eventually butchering it, I don't think they ever thought about that aspect. And when I, I, I really encourage them to participate in a farmer to farmer type mentorship for some hands-on experience before getting any livestock. And I think after we talk through that, they really, I mean, they really did start talking about becoming vegetarians and thought that that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> um, they also wanted to have a cow for fresh milk. They thought that would just be great to be able to go out there and milk that cow whenever they wanted to mil have milk. But when I asked them what they were gonna do with all the excess milk, because depending on what kind of milk cow they got, they would get anywhere from four gal a gallon to four gallons a day. They hadn't thought about that. I also explained to them, when you have a milk cow, you have to milk it every single day. They hadn't thought about that. And um, at any rate, I encourage them to start really, maybe maybe consider starting out with some, some goats, but even with a goat, there's probably more milk than they could drink. But I believe by the time I left and um, provided them with their written evaluation, they had a lot more questions that we followed up with. and. Um, the young woman ended up doing a mentorship program with me the following year, and I, I need to check back with them and see what has happened since then, because that's been um, a couple years now. But the bottom line is managing a piece of land sustainably or managing a small farm is like any small farm business enterprise. And it, it requires a long hours, a long term commitment and a considerable amount of stamina. And while you may not be developing what is technically a small farm, um, creating a more sustainable lifestyle parallels with goals of a small farm venture. It's really uh, important to closely assess your goals and consider alternatives and opportunities and build community around you and develop partnerships. You, you may find that connecting with neighbors and local livestock producers, you can meet your desired outcomes by purchasing locally grown beef and pork and chicken while you learn how to do this on your own piece of land. I mean, we all, my husband has always wanted to get pigs and cows and um, for everything else that we do, that's a lot to add to our daily chores. So we are happy to support our local farmers and let them we we grow our own chicken but we let them do the beef and pork and we're happy with that and i think it's important to know that living a sustainable lifestyle doesn't necessarily mean that you grow all your own food and do everything independently of others it's really important to think about building community of like-minded people around you and as farmers, we tend to isolate ourselves very much, but it's very much about community and community relationships and building that and thinking about you, the likelihood of growing all your own food is um, a great concept, but for those foods that you simply can't produce at your location, you can connect with local growers and plan ahead to order larger quantities of food to freeze or can or dry. I, I love this, this picture of this woman milking the cow. She looks so happy. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> Colette mentioned this, does the existing infrastructure meet your needs? The roads, well, um, how easily can you access different parts of the land? A lot of people, a lot of times people only looking at the access to the house, but like this, these folks from Florida, they 
their 80 acres, they had access to very poor access to where the housing site was, but the rest, that was the only road going into land and it was a long skinny piece. So to access the bottom of the land, there was no way to get there. So it's really important to look at all that and consider if you have year round access. Um, thinking about that, how are you gonna do snow removal in the winter? And if it's a dirt road, what is the spring runoff gonna be like? And will you need a parking area for a farm stand? And it's common to um, not think through those things. And then buildings, are you gonna need buildings for livestock and feed equipment and storage and electricity? That's another thing, do you have access? I suspect that you've talked about some of those things. Irrigation, all the different aspects of that. I think several uh, land consultations I've done have brought me sleepless nights worrying about the well-being of the livestock at the locations that were very poorly designed for the animals and oftentimes as soon as people move onto a piece of land the first thing they do is start investing in livestock and let let me say this and I'm I think I'm already running over time so I don't want to do that but you can read all the books on the subject you want and until you are actually dealing with a 270 pound pig or a 1200 pound cow that doesn't want to go where you want to go that you'll find that the pig or cow did not read the same book that you did. You can, <laughs> you can, uh, Joel Salatin said, you can read any, everything there is about riding the bicycle, but until you actually get on the bike and try to ride it. Uh, so that's just um, there. And I, I had some other stories to share, but I, I think I'm, I'm out of time, am I? Yeah, you're you're getting close. We wrap oh. up in about 10 minutes. Well, so. I don't know if I should stop or keep talking. You know me, I can keep going. <laughs> I think um, I think that these points about family resources and skills, we kind of already talked about that. And I think that's really important that you just think about who's going to do what. And that's a part of your farm plan. So go to the next slide, if you would. Really on the farm, the saying goes, it's always something. And yes, manure happens, as I said in that sign. But I think um, I came up with this quote from Theodore Roosevelt because I really liked it. And I chose it because it applies well to being a good land steward. And I think when you purchase a piece of land, you're really taking a huge responsibility to become the caretaker of this property. And it's important that you make clear observations and look at the landscape and the lay of the land and the diversity of plant life and work with what you have. Really utilizing the natural resources of the land will provide a more sustainable outcome. And as you assess the land and make plans, look for sustainable solutions. I've been teaching for organic gardening workshops on the farm for 25 years. And I always tell my students, make a plan, start small, keep good notes and see what you can manage. So that's that. Thank you, Diane. So I wanna open it up for questions, comments, feedback. So I went to your website, Diane, and um, I, I've not located property yet, but I've been looking and, and actually found a piece today on in Apple that that looks very interesting. But um, so our, your consulting services, is that something that we could uh, we could go ahead and employ well before we purchase? Yes, as long as it's, you know, in the northern part of the state. Got it. I don't want to go very far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And if you're in another part of the state, you know, find the farmers that are there. See, so you know, look for a farm that has an operation that, you know, from what you can tell looks pretty successful or network. And, you know, I think, you know, from my perspective, it is important to really think about that person as a consultant and, and to offer to, to cover their time and their mileage to come out to your place that you're thinking about and walk that with you because as you are going to be a farmer, making your money off the land, that is what they are doing as well. So just really honoring that commitment and time that they're bringing. But I think that 
that's one of the best things you can do is walk the land with another farmer with the type of operation that you want to have. So um, Diane did mention a couple things that I, I didn't cover, but they are on the checklist. And I think this access to the internet is a big one. Um, in a lot of our rural areas, we are still in the last mile situation where internet connectivity is not good. And if that's something that you really need for your sales or your information, then that that might be a deal breaker for you. Um, and, you know, thinking about, you know, I think about this, Tyler and Leah, you know, if you're going to buy open ground, what's the cost of putting the electricity where you want it? And I think Diane had some good points about considering those access points and and that's one of the the things of the infrastructure that I think it's it's hard in many ways to think about this buying this land that doesn't have those things it, or you don't know what the well is because what Diane said about like her neighbors digging 200 feet what then what the neighbor has does not mean you'll have that on your land or if you have to put in another well or multiple wells you can just have a lot of variation. So planning for those costs is really important. And even if that's something that you're gonna be able to get financing for, how you can pay for that. And so people like Jessica are gonna be super helpful. And an, another thing that I've run into a lot with farming, and I'm not saying this is true for anyone in, in this, um, particular situation but many farmers are like I don't want to have debt and they they don't use debt as a tool and that that means that they come into some situations where it's very hard to operate and it's a balance I think you know we hear all these horror stories in agriculture about people that have taken out too much debt and then they can't pay on that debt at the same time you know debt can be a tool and using the the loan programs that are out there that are at this really incredibly low interest rate with some of these promotions and benefits for beginning farmers I think is really important and as um, as Jessica said last week a beginning farmer is not that you're in your 20s I mean many people are but it can be that you are a new farmer. You There's many ways to qualify. And so I really encourage you to take advantage of the USDA programs that are there and do some research so that you're optimizing the options that you have. It's, it's just so incredible, all of the, the resources that are out there and that they're growing around agricultural land and access to funds and credit. It's so likely I, not going to be grants. <laughs> I also encourage a, a mentorship, a farmer to farmer mentorship, if you can do that. Um, and and that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're um, in your 20s. I mean, the last two mentorships that we worked with uh, a local person who had just bought farmland here who was a retired cardiologist and just wanting to be able to be more sustainable on this piece of land that he bought for farming. And um, we often have found that our, our mentorship program, our people are getting, they're older, they're more 50 and older, which is surprising to me, but yep. gotta start somewhere. That's right. Uh, so thank you, Diane. I want to keep us kind of on time and to wrap up. I, uh, I saw that Mackenzie put Diane's website into the chat if you want to follow up with her. I am going to share my screen again really briefly and say that I'm going to make a shameless plug for you to do this evaluation when I send you the link. Um, a few, you know, I offered this class in the spring. I, I got some really good feedback that helped me with this class. And this should probably take you about five to seven minutes to do the evaluation, but I would really appreciate it. So I am going to send you the link. I had originally planned I was going to have you do it why I was here, like in an in-person class, you know, but I want to keep us on time tonight. And so I'm not going to ask that for you from you, but please, if you would do that when I send it out, that would be great. Um, you know, for your next steps, 
everything that's on the course classroom, you're going to have access to that until March 1st. So I essentially leave access until the time that I need to reset it for the next class. Uh, if you haven't looked at it already in number 4E, finding your finding land action plan, I really encourage you to get that out because it has a matrix where you can put your actions and then you can create a time frame for yourself. I know that there's a lot of great things that we've talked about. This has been a flood of information over the last four weeks and everybody has a lot that they still need to do. And please use those resources to do it. I also wanted to um, check in with you all because I am really happy if you feel that it would be helpful to you to schedule over the next uh, couple months um, at this pretty much the same time, like a kind of an a check in time where if you want to come back together, it's just an open time that I hold open if you want to come back and share what you've been doing get some feedback if that's going to help you move forward. I'd be happy to do that. So I just wanted to put it out there and um, as a discussion item. Is that something that you would find to be helpful. I would find that helpful personally. So would I. Yeah, okay. I would do that. Okay, great. So um, Mackenzie and I will look at sometimes, we'll keep it same Thursdays in this same time slot since it, this obviously worked for you because you're on today. And uh, we'll make sure that we have at least um, one time in, in December and another in January, and then we'll reevaluate if you wanna move forward. Uh, Mackenzie has added you to our Cultivating Success newsletter list that comes out uh, every other week. So the second and fourth uh, Wednesdays of the month. And we try to really keep that up to date on resources and programs that we see coming across our desk or that we're offering. There are quite a few things that are coming in the spring. Well, actually coming in January. Uh, so. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about those. And if any time you don't want that newsletter, there's an unsubscribe on it or send Mackenzie or I an email and we will take you off. So let's see. Um, the other thing, I have a question and this is my final question for you tonight. And I really condensed this course. As you know, from the classroom, this is really identified as an eight week course. and I condensed it because a lot of the feedback that I've gotten in um, evaluations is that people are looking more for workshops or short courses. But now that you've taken the course, would you think that it would have been valuable to have more weeks where we would have had more time to, like in real time, go to like the links I showed you today and for you to be able to actually access those tools why we're in class or work through some of the worksheets why we're in class. Those are the things that get taken out when I condense the course. And so I just wanted some feedback on whether you think, yeah, this short course really worked or ah, I think that it would have been better if you'd added a few more sessions and given a bit more time for those types of activities. I'm feeling a little mixed just because I'm trying to, I've been really hitting the business education hard this year. And so I'm, I'm kind of teetering on burnout of doing Zoom calls and, and being in class. So like, I think if I, if I were, if I had been doing less at the time, I would have appreciated a couple more weeks, maybe not another four weeks, but like maybe two weeks and a little bit more time to kind of flesh out some of the, some stuff would have been nice, but at the same time, I'm really kind of relieved that I get to take a break. Like I'm done with HMI, I'm done with a couple things and I'm looking forward to having a little bit of, break, of a break for the holidays, you know? Um, but I think it's more circumstantial that I feel that way, okay. I guess is what I'm getting at. Thanks, thank you. I see that. I think I'm good with the four weeks. 
I, I will follow up on all of the links. Um, so that, that's weekend time for me because it's pretty busy during the week. Four weeks I think is enough, but there's, there is so much content here that I'm going to have to go back through all the presentations, chase all the links. Um, it's been, I, I will say this, I think it, it's, uh, the value is tremendous though. It, uh, it's worth way more than what I paid for the course. Thank you. Thank you. I think the four week window was really good too. If you decided you wanted to go longer, I would only do five or six, eight would be too much. But like you said, where it's all available, all the links and everything until March. Um, I think the four weeks was great. We got all the information covered that way. And then you can just go back in and access kind of more of what's specifically relevant, I guess. Um, yeah. That's kind of our okay. thought. Okay. Thanks. I agree. I liked the four weeks. Um, it was perfect and it's just enough. And but six weeks wouldn't be bad either. But way more information than worth $25 for sure. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Hey, well, I really appreciate that. Um I see that Marcy also put a comment in the chat. So thank you, Marcy. And I, I want to thank all of you for coming. And I know Jennifer joined our, our class late and she is on. So just so you know that uh, I really appreciate that you were able to make this last session, Jennifer, and you do have access to all of the recordings in the website. Please feel free to contact me if something comes up and you um, want to talk something over, you need additional resources, you're looking at to connect with somebody in, you know, your region, I'm happy to help you with that. And I look forward to seeing you when we check in, in a few weeks in December. So again, thank you so much for being part of the course. It's been really fun for me. I'm excited about each one of your journeys. And I hope that I get to maintain a relationship with you and be connected with you in different ways um, as you develop your farms and move forward. So I hope it's the beginning of you seeing me as part of your team. OK, thank, thank you, you so much, everyone. Have a great thank night. You so thank, you. thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, Diane. You so much. Bring us on. You're welcome. Hey, good night. Good night.